it's a pleasure to be here with you all um, as we talk about this important topic. Um, I also want to take the time to acknowledge um, Dr. Dr. Blair, who also invited me to be on this platform. Thank you, Dr. Blair, and the host pastor, who's also my pastor, Pastor Bulgin. Um, thank you also. I also want to recognize some family members who, who joined um, as well, my family members that have joined and some of my colleagues that are online as well. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, depression and suicide amongst teenagers. And this is a very, this is a topic that's very near and dear to me um, for more than one reason, and I'll talk about it in a little bit uh, while I get my screen. So I just want to make sure, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, great. All right, so um, like I mentioned, this is a very near and dear topic to me. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I went to spend the summer in Costa Rica with my uncle. Um, I was always close to my uncles, you know, my, both my mother and father's side. And so I went to spend the summer with him. Um, a little while into the vacation, um, I got a, we were supposed to go somewhere, but I got distracted and didn't go with him. And so um, the next day, that the day that we were supposed to go to the event, I got a call from his girlfriend's mother who said that he was talking about killing himself. And so where I was staying, um, the town that I was staying in was about a half hour walk. Um, and, you know, you have to see it to, to understand the structure, but basically you could walk a train, like the, it's in the country area. And so you could walk the train line and just walk to the different towns. And that's what everybody did. Nobody really drove unless you had a lot of money. So everybody just walked the train line and went to the different towns. And so um, I walked over to the town where he was um, and I spoke with him for a little bit. He was very agitated and irritable, um, tried to find out what was going on and he wouldn't talk to me. You know, he was, he was just, so I went and got my cousins. Um, they tried to talk to him. They tried to drag him out the house and, but he jumped out of the truck and went back into the house. I, I went around the area and got some of his friends to help, but um, nobody seemed to be willing to, to, to help him um, or able to help him. Um, later on that night, uh, we got news that he drunk uh, some gromosome. Some of you may know what gromosome is. It's it's a weed killer. It's what farmers use to kill weeds um, from their crops. So he drunk it and he passed away three days later. But before he died, um, he was very, um, he, he repented for what he did and he was very sorry for what he did. Uh, but nevertheless, it did eventually kill him. And so this had a profound impact on me for years. And it's actually part of the reason why I entered this field uh, is because of this whole story. And so when I talk about the things that we're going to talk about today, um, it's, it's stuff that I've seen and, you know, not only on a professional level, but also on a personal level. And so here are some basic facts. I want to start off with the uh, scripture, Matthew chapter 24, and verse 7, uh, where it talks about pestilences in the last days. I want us to look at depression and suicide as a pestilence, as a disease, because that's what that's what they are. They are um, things that happen that is that are beyond the individual's control. And so, um, just like just like how we would look at cancer, heart disease, diabetes, we also need to put depression in that same category because it is a disease. It's a disease of the mind. And so here are some basic stats. Um, first stat from the Center for Disease Control is that suicide is the second leading cause of death among 10 and 24 year olds. So from kids to all the way to our young adult population, the second leading, leading cause of death is suicide. Every 11 minutes within the US, a person dies from suicide. And so to kind of put this into context, you figure it will be presenting for about um, about 40, roughly 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, and so by the time we finish this presentation, four people would have died from suicide based on these stats. For every successful suicide, there are many prior attempts. And so 
most times when um, people commit suicide, they've tried multiple times in the past. When there's increased when there's increased access to weapons, to guns, to pills, that that's an increased risk as well. Females contemplate more on suicide and and do so by usually pills or cutting, while boys have. Or f- I should that should really be males because it, it applies to adults as well. So males and females, um, they're different in how they process su- uh, suicide and suicidal ideation. So females. They tend to think about it more and they use less lethal means. So they'll make, they may slit their wrists. They may overdose on pills. And some, a lot of times the pills are not, um, are not lethal enough to actually die, but it does cause some health complications. So they're more likely to have more attempts while males are more likely to have more lethal means and are more successful at suicide. So males will use more lethal means like uh, using a gun, or um, hanging themselves, jumping off bridges, buildings. So males are more successful at suicide completions while females tend to have more attempts and um, have more ideations, meaning that they think about it more. And here are some of the risk factors. So typically when you have a teen that has a diagnosed mental health disorder depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and also alcohol and drug use, they're more at risk. A lot of reasons, um, but mainly because while they're under the influence, um, you tend to get these depressive feelings. um, And so you start thinking about ending your life and that it's not, you're not worth being here. And so sometimes when they are high and under the influence, they may make a suicide attempt. Um, and, you know, it's establishing our second point that 95% of people who die by suicide have a confirmed mental health diagnosis. So at some point um, in that person's life, they were diagnosed with a mental health disorder. When a person is increasingly under distress, stressed out all the time, they're always irritable or they're always agitated, they're at risk as well. So suicide risk also um, is, follow, is, is also a company for people who have a sense of hopelessness, worthlessness, previous attempts, family history of suicide. And so one of the things that we do, and um, you know, part of what I do is I work in a hospital, um, in the emergency room, and I evaluate all of the psychiatric patients, along with the psychiatrist that comes into the emergency room. I see them first and the psychiatrist sees them. And basically, uh, when we are screening for suicide, we ask one, if the person is having thoughts, but then we go in more depth. So if they're having thoughts, like, is there an actual plan, right? So are they just having thoughts about life would be better not being here? Or is there an actual plan? Like, do they have access to a gun? Do they have access to a means to kill themselves? And do they have a specific time and when they plan to do it? And so sometimes when people are um, actually suicidal to the point where they have a plan and everything, it's very detailed. You know, they say, well, I'm, I wanna say goodbye to my loved ones first. And then on Monday, you know, at around two o'clock, I think that's the best time to do it. So we, we've heard this a lot in, in the emergency room when we, when we have patients come in. Um, and so what we also look for when we evaluate the patients are, um, what are some of the protective factors? And so, The last two bullets talk about um, social support and poor relationship with peers and parents. And so some of the protective factors, like what would decrease the risk of suicide is if that person had um, an established social support system, um, if there's any connections with healthy connections with peers or, um, you know, any type of mental health treatment. And so, um, you know, these are the things that we have to weigh when we determine if a person is, is, is like super high risk or medium risk or low risk. Um, the other thing that we look at, again, is this past suicide attempts. So a lot of times when people come in, they said, yeah, maybe a year ago I, I took pills. Maybe a year ago I tried to hang myself but somebody burst, somebody came through the door. Um, and so there, there's, different, there's um, various things that we look for. And then we also look for like if the person has been um, talking about it a lot. So if they've been researching how to die, researching the best and pain, most painless way to die, we, we look for that as well. Um, and, and, that's, and that's what we use to evaluate the level of risk. 
um, and, su and suicidal. And also we see um, suicide attempts among um, teenagers that have questions about their gender identity. Um, so we get a lot, we get a lot of patients with questions about their gender identity that come in that are also at high risk because one, they come from environments that are really hostile. Um, and so they kind of feel like, you know, they're rejected and, and there's really no one to turn to. And so they're, they're also at risk. So the, so we, in talking about the various causes of depression, um, one has to, um, you know, there's various, various causes. Um, and so we'll talk about um, the faulty mood regulation by the brain. Now to your right, um, you'll see two, two brain images, right? One with the depressed brain and one with the not depressed brain. Now what you see in the depressed brain are little yellow spots and what you see in the not depressed brain are, you know, longer yellow, yellow um, spots. Now these yellow spots are your neurons. Your neurons are um, nerve cells that send messages throughout your body. When you, when, you know, when you look at the depressed brain, you'll notice that the neurons are, are, sh are short or shrinking. And in, not, in, in the person that's not depressed, um, you see they're pretty long and they're connected. And so people that um, are diagnosed with um, clinical depression, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about the differences in depression. People that are diagnosed with clinical depression and have had it a while, they tend to um, have the, their brains are more like the image on the left. And so the parts of your brain that depression impacts, there's it, about four parts. Um, and the first part is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is the part of your brain that um, impacts your, your learning. So you're learning new things that happens through the hippocampus and your memory. And it also regulates your um, emotions and stress hormones. And so when, when, you when a person is diagnosed with depression, the brain um, and has long-term depression, I should say, the brain shrinks, right? And that's why you see there's little spots on the depressed brain. The brain shrinks and um, it, it causes some challenges. And so some of the challenges that we see with a person that whose hippocampus is shrunken is that they have difficulty concentrating, there's memory loss, difficulty completing familiar tasks, and then that leads to guilt and anxiety. And so, you know, most times because we can't physically see, right, like any any injuries on the person when they're depressed, um, it's it's hard to really understand what they're going through. But you know, technology has shown us that depression is is this is how depression is impacting the brain. So when a person is depressed and they don't want to do certain things, or they can't not not that they don't want to, is that they can't. They literally cannot do certain things because of the, um, the compromised state that the brain is in. The second part of your brain that's impacted by, impacted when depression happens is when the person's diagnosed with long-term clinical depression, it impacts the, free, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex. And that part of your brain has to do with um, your impulse control, right? Um, your ability to adapt to new challenges. And it also, also processes and regulates your emotions. And so when this part of the brain is shrunk, um, you know, people become more impulsive, easily, easily agitated and upset. Um, and then, you know, they have what's called brain fog. So, you know, sometimes when you're talking to people, they can't get their thoughts clear, right? And that's, that's, that's brain fog. It's like they, they have things that they want to say, but they just can't get it out or there's some confusion, right? And so that's, that's, that's part of it. Um, and then there's also um, challenges with, especially when the prefrontal cortex is, um, is compromised, there's challenges with making decisions. And so some, you know, most times when um, the prefrontal cortex is damaged, um, there's an inability with, um, there's an inability with making, making decisions. And, and so we look at that too, when we're evaluating um, patients is their, their judgment and um, their insight, because that has to do with decision-making. The third part of the brain that's impacted by depression is um, the thalamus. And that has to do with, your, uh, that's, the, that's the part of your brain that regulates your sleep and your, your alertness and your attentiveness. And when this brain is shrunken, when this part of the brain is shrunken, 
it, it there's difficulty maintaining a healthy sleep pattern and also impacts your appetite. And so when we're evaluating patients in the emergency room, we also, um, you know, for depression and suicide, we also ask about their sleep patterns, like how often do they get sleep? How many hours a night? How much? How many times a day do they eat? Um, what's their energy like? And that, that has to do with, um, you know, assessing how severe the depression is. Right. Then we have the amygdala, which which also impacts which which impacts um, your feelings of pain. I mean, your, sorry, your feelings of pleasure and fear. Right. It's a it's a gland that's in front of and from the hippocampus and that and that part of the brain when depression when a person is diagnosed with depression that part of the brain becomes overactive and it secretes a lot of the stress hormone that we know as cortisol and that too causes issues and so when we have high high um when we have instances of um, um, a lot of cortisol being released by this gland um again it it really it, it results in disturbed sleep patterns um, high anxiety, restlessness, guilt, over, overly guilt, and um, panic. And then it also causes brain inflammation, um, which, which again, when the brain is inflamed, your brain is always changing, right? New cells always being developed. But when your brain is inflamed, it, it, it stops new cells from developing, causes the old cells to die, the old brain cells to die, and then it causes your brain to age faster, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, and so, another cause of depression is genetic predisposition. And so, if you have a history, family history of depression, um, that too can be a risk factor. So, when we when we when we talk to the patients, we also ask if there's any mental illness in the family, you know, and they'll say, "Well, my grandfather had bipolar disorder, my mother had depression, my father had anxiety." So, we hear things like that. And then that, that helps us to figure out what's going on with the patient, right? So genetic predisposition is always important. Then we look at stressful life events. Did that person experience any, any level of trauma? Any, you know, any recent events, break up with a boyfriend, break up with a girlfriend, divorce, um, issues with children, issues with, with employment, right? So we look at things like that. And then also there's medical problems, right? So if a person has a terminal illness, you know, the sense, is, the sense of hopelessness sometimes accompanies that. Um, and so we look at that as well. Or if they're in chronic pain, right? There's, there's a lot of Ill, um, met, uh, physical illnesses that cause chronic pain. And um, that leads to depression too, because the person is hopeless. They're in pain all the time. They just want it to end. You know, so we look at that as well. Now, one of the other things, one of the other things about depression that we should know is that there's, there is uh, different types um, and so typically what you would see with a stressful life event is um, what we call adjustment disorder, right? And so adjustment disorder is your emotional response to a stressful life event. So you just broke up with a boyfriend, you just broke with your, hu uh, your husband, your wife, um, you're going to be stressed out, you're going to be depressed. Um, but that's a lot different from clinical depression. Or, you know, like a, if, a, if a relative passed away, um, you know, you just lost a job or something or something stressful, um, what will happen in between the time of the event and, you know, a few weeks, few months down the road is that you'll have adjustment disorder. And there's different types of adjustment disorders, right? There's adjustment disorder with depression, adjustment disorder with anxiety. We have some, we have adjustment dis disorder with depression and anxiety. Sometimes it's with conduct. And so there's different types, but adjustment disorder with depression um, will have a lot of symptoms as clinical depression. But the difference between the two is that when you have it, when you have the um, adjustment disorder with depressive symptoms, those symptoms, right, of what we just talked about earlier, they, they're going to last. They're going to last for about six months, right? After six months, you know, usually the person will, will be able to bounce right out of it and, and, and pretty much move on with their life. But the person that's unable to do so, right, after that six-month period, so that's kind of the benchmark, then it, it can lead to clinical depression. And then when we see clinical depression, that's when we look at these brain images, because that means that um, that person is, is on, along the lines of clinical depression, you know, after that six-month period. So, I mean, obviously, there's, there's, there's a lot of exceptions, right? This, this can happen a lot sooner, right? But Usually the benchmark is about six months. Um, that's what we work. We work with about six months. 
So when a person says that, you know, something has happened to them, we ask how long ago that happened, um, you know, to help us figure out how long the person's been suffering. Um, and so we talked, you know, a little bit about, um, you know, some symptoms of depression earlier, but here's some more. Um, so it's, it's uh, irritability. So the person is always irritable. Um, you know, you, you know, you, you know, some people, they, they call, they call the person a grouch, right? Um, because the person is just, this always irritable, miserable, um, just really, no matter what you do, they, they see things from a pessimistic negative view, right? That's just, it. that's just the way they look at the world from a negative perspective. So you could be celebrating about something good that has happened to you. That person will pull out all of the bad that could happen. So you just made, you just got a promotion. Um, you just, you know, something happened. You celebrate and the person would, would uh, pull out, like the, would find something negative to say about the situation. Um, so that's a sign of depression, right? Feeling hopeless, feeling, feeling empty. So the person, there's really no um, positive outlook on life. So when we, when we talk to patients that are depressed, uh, some of the things that we ask is, um, what are you hopeful about in the future? And, we, and this, this, is, this is with the adults as well as with the teens, because with the teens, and the adolescents, we want to find out, like, do, what do they have aspirations to become? So if they, if they talk about, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor. When I grow up, I want to be a police officer. When I grow up, I want to be an artist. Um, we know that there's some, some inkling of hope there because they're thinking about the future. But a lot of times when a person is depressed and suicidal, they really can't see past the here and now. All they want to do is die. And so when we ask them, um, you know, you know, about, about their future, they can't, they can't tell us, right? Because they, they really can't see that far. They don't, they don't want to be around. And so they, they tell us this. So that's, that's really hopelessness. Like nothing's going to work out for them. Everything they do is going to mess up. There's really no point in being here, right? And then also there's this emptiness inside. They don't feel whole. Um, they, never, they never felt like they belong anywhere. Right. Then we also, you know, we also look for changes in appetite. Right. So if um, a month ago they were eating three times a day, um, then now they, they go to eating um, once a day or, you know, they skip meals at times. That's a concern for us as well. Um, if the person is always tired, difficulty getting out of bed, difficulty performing the activities of daily living. So that that's like bathing, um, you know, um, you know, different things like, like going, you know, just different things like hygiene, different things like that. If they have difficulties with that, then that's also a concern. Low energy, they just they just can't function. It's just it's just no motivation there. Right. Insomnia, you know, poor sleeping. They only get one night of sleep, one hour a night per, for sleep. Um, so that that's a concern as well. Or if they stay up all night worrying, right, or they stay up all night sad, that's a concern as well. All right, then we look at retardation of, of body movement and thinking. So that's just basically when um, they move very slowly. Um, again, we talked earlier about the, the neurons and how they send messages to the body. So once there's depression, um, the neurons shrink, right? Your brain shrinks. So when we talk about brain shrink, brain shrinking, that's your neurons that are shrinking. And so that leads to, um, you know, there's really not, not a lot of active brain cells to be able to send messages to your body. So it slows down your movements, right? And it slows down, your, your thinking is slowed down. Your thinking is um, delayed as well, right? And then if the person is isolated all the time, like they, they don't want to be around other people, um, they just like when you, when you take them, when you take them out, they always find a place to be alone. That's a, that's a concern for us as well. All right, and so some of the warning signs of suicide, right? If the person is always uh, talking about suicide and death, like they just have this fascination of that, about dying, um, that's a concern as well. Um, you know, um, we see this a lot with teens. Um, when they come into the emergency room, we talk to their parents, we talk to friends. A lot of times they'll, they'll post stuff on social, me social media about death, um, you know, They'll say things like, um, it's been real. Um, I may not be around tomorrow, you know, and if they did wrong to somebody, they'll say, well, tell that person, I'm sorry for what I did. Um, different things like that, um, they'll, they'll, they'll post. And so that's a concern as well. So we usually see it, especially with teens, we see it a lot in text messages. They'll text their parents, they'll, they'll text, you know, sometimes they'll write a suicide note. Um, but there's always this fascination about dying. Um, and then they offer hints of, that they may not be around no more. Um, so again, it's like saying goodbye, um, not directly, but indirectly. Um, 
different things like that. And so um, they also, you know, again, there's this hopelessness, there's this guilt about something that they may have done. Um, and they're always like fixated on. So every time you talk to them, they talk about things that they're bad things that they've done to people. And it's just really hard for them to get over it. Um, you know, and then, you know, again, we spoke about isolation. They're writing poems, songs about death, writing letters about death. You know, the shows that they watch is always, um, is always focused on death in some way, you know, the way they present. So these are things to look out for. Um, another sign is when they're giving away possessions. Now, you know, if um, they've had like prized possessions and out of the blue, they're talking about, they come to you and they say, well, you know, mom, I want to give this, I want to give this to that one, give this to my friend, give this to my cousins. That's something to look out for because it means that they, they have something planned, you know, because if you know that they've enjoyed using certain items and then all of a sudden they just want to give it away, that's a, that's a serious red flag. Um, you know, uh, poor concentration is something else that, that's, a, that's a warning sign. They can't focus. Um, you know, think the judgment is clouded, changes in, in sleeping or eating habits, and also engaging in at-risk behaviors. So we, when we talk about at-risk behaviors, we're talking about hyposexuality, uh, multiple sex partners, um, excessive drug usage, um, just really, just really over-the-edge behaviors. Um, loss of interest in school and sports and usual activities and enjoyment. So this is this is also um, really important. If you know that they've enjoyed basketball, you know that they've enjoyed playing football, you know, volleyball, or um, they've enjoyed art, and then they, they stop doing these things. Um, it's it's a it's a red flag as well. So that these are things to these are things to kind of keep your eye on. And so I have this picture here. Um, so, you know, because one, we, we always have um, this pre-notion of what suicidal people look like, right? And so what you notice about these four men is that, um, and some of you may know who they are. These are, these, are, these are celebrities that have killed themselves, all of them. And so um, the first one at the top to my left is uh, Robin Givens. Many of, you, many of you know him, sorry, Robin Williams. Uh, many of you know him from different movies. He's a comedian, enjoyed making people laugh. His family found him hanging one day, right? To, to, to the right is Don Cornelius. He started Soul Food. I'm sorry, Soul Food. Soul Train. Um, you know, again, like back in the 60s and 70s, bringing Black people together because they've gone through so much. So he, he, had a, he had a show on TV to celebrate Blackness. And, you know, it was a forum where, where Black people can kind of put the stresses they were facing it, facing at the time, the racism, the, the mistreatment at the time, and could really come together and enjoy themselves. And he enjoyed putting on those shows. He had different Black celebrities that would come on and, and, and perform. And it was a time where people just really felt good about being Black. Um, and so he committed to it. He, he shot, they found him with a self-inflicted gunshot. Um, Bottom to the left is Chris Farley. Um, many of you know him from the 90s. Uh, he was also well-loved, um, just, just a funny guy. Um, he died of a drug overdose. And then to the bottom to the right um, was, was uh, Lee. He, he, acted, he acted in a lot of movies, but, but he also suffered from bipolar disorder. His family found, he was 29 years old. His family uh, found him dead from a self-inflicted gunshot. But, what you the, the common the common thing that we see among these four individuals is that they dedicated their lives to trying to make people feel good, but in the end, on 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 the flip side, internally they were they were very depressed, um, and unfortunately um, it got to the point where it cost them their lives. Um, so you know, just also want to make sure you keep that in the back of your mind that you know, depression may not always you know sat people. But suicide may not, may not always look sad. Um, they may look like this. Now, one of the other things that I want to bring our attention to is um, during the COVID, we had a really we had a severe mental health crisis, especially with our adolescent population, um, and we really don't have conclusive data on how much how how severe it was, but. You know, anecdotally, meaning that from experience, we, we, we definitely saw a few things. And so um, between April 2020 and October 2020, 
hospitals saw a rise in um, visits from kids and adolescents that presented with various mental health conditions. And so they, they may have come in with heightened anxiety, heightened depression, suicidal. Um, they may have been off their medications. And so, you know, every, every profession that worked in the medical field and in, in, in the mental health field and specifically can attest that they saw an increase um, in adolescents coming to the emergency room. And I, and I can tell you that this is true because, um, you know, during COVID, um, we, we did see a lot of a lot more adolescents come in um, to the emergency room for different mental health um, conditions. Um, one in five adolescents have contemplated suicide during the pandemic. Um, and again, there's no, clear, there's no clear data that exists on the total suicide numbers as a result of the pandemic. But um, again, based on what we're seeing and um, with adolescents and kids coming to the emergency room for mental health conditions, we, we can assume that there's been an increase. But again, uh, the statisticians are still collecting data, so we don't have those numbers yet, but they'll be out soon. Um, then we saw an increase in adolescents coming to the emergency rooms, and this is across the country, not just in New York, across the country. Um, we saw an increase of um, adolescents coming to the emergency rooms with uh, suicide attempts. And um, what, what's interesting though, before the pandemic, um, there was the, you know, statisticians have determined that there, there had already been um, an increase in suicide, right? And so what we can, what we can, what we can deduce from this is that um, the pandemic probably exacerbated that number even higher. We already, there was already a, a steep incline, uh, already an incline that was happening, but we can imagine that because of the pandemic, because of the things that were so the pandemic, that, that it probably boosted it up, the suicide numbers. All right, and so some of the things that the adolescents that we saw complained about was um, they had less contact with others, right? So everybody was home on, on Zoom, right? Um, school was on Google Classroom. So they didn't have that that social that social contact, and we, you know, we we we're human. We're made to socialize with each other, and so um, because of the pandemic, because we had to isolate, um, it 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 really it really caused um, more cases of depression, more anxiety, um, and that's part of the reason why we see we saw a lot of um, adolescents come to the emergency room. Right then, there was a um, the mental health services that were available. Um, we're not the same as it were pre-pandemic. So instead of being able to see like adolescents that have mental health conditions and that were in treatment, instead of being able to go into an office <clears throat> to see the therapist, they had to talk to them on Zoom, they had to talk to them on a tablet. It, and it's just not the same, right? It's just not the same as having somebody in a room with you versus talking to them over the tablet. And it, it's still happening now, even though you know there's, there's been improvements with the pandemic, the numbers have gone down. A lot of the services, mental health services, are still happening virtually, and so that that's always a challenge. And you, you they'll come in and they'll say, "Look, I can't, um, I can't, I can't do it. I can't talk to somebody over Facetime. I can't. I need to be in a room with the person, All right?" And so they're like, if they're struggling emotionally with something, um, having that person only available via internet or some type of virtual platform made the situation make the situation worse. Right. And then again, um, there's limited access to their regular social supports. Right. So they can only see that they only were able to see their teacher online. They were only able to see the guidance counselor online. They only were able to talk to their friends online. The other caring adults that they would be able to go over to the house, they couldn't do it because nobody, you know, back then nobody understood the disease and everybody would they were just telling everybody to stay home. And so during that time, they really couldn't um, interact with people who have normally Played a, played a supportive role in their life. So a lot of the supports were compromised, right? So here are some suggestions on how you can help, right? Especially if you are with a team that um, is depressed, suicidal, the first thing you could do is look for the warning signs, right? Um, nobody commits suicide out the blue. Nobody gets up and say, I want to kill myself. It's, it's something that's been happening over time. Um, and if you look attentively, right? And so sometimes, look, sometimes there's, this ex, there's the exceptional cases. Sometimes you may not have been able to see the signs, right? Sometimes the person may have got up and said, look, I don't feel like being alive today and they end their life, right? There's always exceptional cases. 
this is really talking about most times, right? You'll, you'll see some type of warning that the person um, is thinking about ending their life, right? And, and it's a lot of the signs that I, I spoke to you about earlier, right? Giving away the prized possessions, the increased irritability, the increased sadness, the mood changes, that's something you have to look out for, um, different things like that, right? The other thing is don't ignore your team when they say I wanna kill them, when, I, when they say I wanna kill myself, right? And let me just stop here for a minute. Um, earlier in the presentation, I told you that um, uh, folks between in this country, folks between the the, the number two co- the number two co- the second leading cause of death um, with uh, persons ages ten to twenty four year old is uh, suicide, right? And so the fifth leading cause of death in that in that age group is cancer. But what you'll notice, right? And, and I'm sure you you you'll probably attest to this is that. If, you're, if you take your, your, your child to the doctor and the doctor comes back and say, you know, I'm sorry, your child has cancer, the parent is going to jump through the roof to try to get that child the best care, to try to get that child um, access to the best oncologist, the best treatment team to try to get that cancer under control. But if your son walks, your son or daughter walks in and say, look, I want to kill myself, um, mo- what most parents do is look at it as attention-seeking behavior and they, they stop right there and they don't pursue it further. Right. Even though the stats have shown that suicide is killing more adolescents and young adults than cancer. Right. But again, if if you take your, your child to the doctor's office and they say I have cancer, you're going to jump through the roof and try to get help. But if on the flip side, if they say, look, I'm going to kill myself, it's, it's really no, nah, you know, nothing's wrong. You're just going to have a bad day. You know, it's not. But it's, it should be the reverse when, when they say I want to kill myself. We should actually be jumping through the roof to try to get the child some help um, so that it doesn't go any further, right? Um, so that's, that's just something that we, we really have to take a look at because, um, you know, again, um, most people see mental health as a stigma. Um, they don't take it seriously, but I've shown you clear evidence that it is a, it is a disease, right? You see how it impacts the brain? You see how it impacts, uh, we spoke about how it impacts the functioning. So we have to take it seriously, right? So when teens are ignored, um, it increases the chances they may commit suicide. So if, um, you know, you notice that your child's mood, mood has, uh, your child's mood has changed, they're talking about hurting themselves and you ignore that, then it increases the likelihood that they will make an attempt. So it's another reason why you should stay focused and, and um, be attentive to what the child is reporting. Also, it's okay, you know, it's, it's scary for a parent, but it's okay to ask your child if they've ever had thoughts of wanting to hurt themselves. It's okay to ask that, it's, it's very scary. No parent, no parent ever wanna be faced with something like that. Their kid telling them, look, yes, I've had thoughts of hurting myself. I have thoughts of dying. That's very scary for a parent, very scary. But it's okay to ask that question, right? And sometimes your teen, or y- y- your child may be happy you've asked that question because they've been holding it in for so long. And, you know, it's a really disturbing feeling. Nobody wants to walk around with thoughts of wanting to hurt themselves. They, they can't feel good about that. But you- you'd be surprised if you prompt and ask, they may feel a sense of relief and want to share that information with you. And then you in turn can kind of get them to the point where they're ready to, to get some help, um, to help deal with that, right? Then if it's okay, you know, sometimes your teens may not feel connected to you. It's a stage that they go through. You don't take it personal. Please don't take it personal. Um, you know, teens get to a point where the friends are more important or where other adults in their life are more important. Don't take it personal. Find somebody that's neutral, that can talk to your teen and get, and, and get information from them as to what's going on with them emotionally. It will help you in the long run, don't don't take it personal if they say, "Look, I don't feel like talk. I don't I don't feel comfortable talking to you about this." Don't take it personal. What you do as a parent is get somebody that they will talk to, right? You ask if they feel like talking to a professional, a confidential professional, you know, or if Uncle Uncle Joe is is um, have a good relationship with them. You, you call Uncle Joe over. Look, something's going on. Can you please get the information out of him? And then you and then you try to get that that team some help. Now, obviously, if, if a team, if somebody tells you that they, they want to commit suicide, you can't um, you can't just let that go. You have to, you know, you, you need to take them to the hospital to get evaluated. Right. There's just some things. Right. There's just some things that you can't like put off, like some things you have to do involuntary. Like we get we get people that come in 
Um, and, you know, after they tell us that they're suicidal and we evaluate that they're not safe, right? We can, we can um, you know, psychiatrists can hold them against their will, right? So even if they came in voluntarily, like if the psychiatrist feels that um, there's, there's a high enough risk that if they're discharged, they'll kill themselves, then they have, the, the psychiatrist has the legal right to keep them in the hospital. So sometimes um, it has to be done involuntarily to protect that person and to protect society, right? And so there's times when you know things have to be done involuntarily. Um, you don't want it, you don't want you never want things to be done involuntarily. But when a person's safety is at risk, it has to be done involuntarily, right? And then you know you just got to figure out the pieces later on how to mend that relationship again. But when it gets to the point where a person is um, actively suicidal and 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 um, you know. You know, we have to we, we have to take measures to protect them and protect, you know, society. So um, there's, there's times when it has to be done involuntary. Right. And here's some other ways that you can help. Um, so, again, you know, um, the city, New York City, um, I, work, I work in the city, uh, lived in the city for many years. Their, their, their gun rules are pretty, pretty strict. Um, but, you know, I moved up to the Hudson Valley five years ago. And, um, you know, you, you know this, especially like when we talk to people in the emergency room, almost everybody has a gun in their house, right? Because they, they use it for hunting or they, they it's registered for protection. They're, almost everybody have a gun in their house, right? And so um, you, when you have kids in your house, you have to keep those things locked away, keep it stored away so that nobody has access to it. Um, because having access to those things um, does increase the risk. Right. If you know there's some dangerous medications around, you have to keep them locked away. Right. Sometimes when, um, you know, sometimes when we're able to develop a safety plan with a family to get the patient discharged, part of the safety plans we talk we talk about keep um, you keep medicine, keep pills, you keep weapons, sharp objects, keep them locked away. Um, but only certain people have access to it. So that's part of the safety plan. If we feel like they're safe enough to be discharged from the hospital. Um, you always like if you find out your teen has a substance abuse problem or a mental health problem, never leave it untreated. Get the kid, get your child some help um, right away, because if you allow it to fester, you're allowed to get worse. It will get to the point where um, you just it'll just be that much more difficult. The longer you let it sit, the much more it's going to be more difficult to get to get um, for your child to be amendable to accepting help. So if you find out about it. Um, that's the time to really figure out how to get your child some help um, to deal with those issues. And also, this is important. Be supportive. Do not be critical of um, your child when they come to you with certain things. When they come to you with certain things, it's their feelings, right? It's not your feelings. It's the way they feel. So you have to be empathetic, right? Um, you can't say, well, yeah, I dealt with that when I was younger and this is what I did. No, it doesn't apply to you. It, it, it's what they're going through. And you have to take it serious, right? It's the way they feel about something. So if something's stressing them out, don't minimize it. Because what you do is you close the door um, from them coming to you for help in the future. So they come to you with something and you minimize it, you dismiss it, say, yeah, I dealt with that, you know, and it's, don't worry, it's easy. So, you know, that, that'll turn them off and they'll never come to you. Most times they won't come back to you for help again. Um, and you've lost an opportunity to help them in the future. They come to you with something, you listen. Don't talk, listen. Give them, give them your undivided attention. Because when you do that and they feel they feel heard, that starts to um that start that opens the door for you to um for the for you to be able to um you know get that child, bridge that child to, to the help that they need to deal with that issue, right? Um, so please be supportive, avoid criticism, and always stay connected to your child. Right. Um, and so the other thing that I wanted to mention um, specifically is that um, when getting your child some help, right, or you getting help for depression or suicidal thinking, you may feel that, um, yeah, I've been in therapy before, it didn't work. You know, therapists, right, we, this is social work one-on-one. -on -one. Therapy will not be helpful if the therapist does not have a relationship with the patient. So the therapist could have all the clinical training that they want. 
you know, but if, if that therapeutic relationship is not established, everything else will go out the door. You have some therapists with, with, um, that don't have a lot of, um, you know, that may not have a lot of, you know, clinical training, but they have the ability to develop a relationship with the patient. And that helps a lot more than, um, that, that helps a lot more than, you know, you have in, you know, training in CBT, DBT and all that stuff. You, you have to have a therapist to build a relationship with the patient. And that, that may take a few sessions. It may take six, seven sessions, because again, it all depends on how, how the patient feels about opening up about how they feel. If they're not ready to open up, you keep bringing them until they get to the point where they're comfortable and then they start opening up. But if you say, look, I, I took them to one session, it didn't work, that's not enough. They have to keep going. But sometimes it may not be a good fit. You know, there's just, you know, human nature. There, there's just some people we don't, we, we may not, we may not mesh with. And so um, sometimes you have to try maybe two, three, four therapists until you get, until you get the right therapist, right? And then also, when you're dealing with, uh, when you're dealing with clinical depression, right? Because we spoke earlier about the difference between adjustment disorder with depression and clinical depression. Your therapist has to be trained um, with CBT. That's that's a cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a more structured therapy. When a person is clinically depressed, they can't go into a therapy session. Therapist asks them, "Hey, how was your day? How did that make you feel?" That's not going to work. It has to be a structured therapy. Well, that person is um, sitting down, recording all of the negative thought, journal, journaling all of the negative thoughts that they had for, for that day, and then figuring out how to replace those negative thoughts with positive thoughts, and then working with the therapist through that, right? That's just more structured. They have an established treatment plan, and they're working towards meeting the goals in that treatment plan, right? The other thing, too, is that they may need to, the person may need to be on medication for a while. The idea is not to keep them on the medication, but the person may need to be on medication, right? Now, one of the things that um, we also, um, you know, make, make sure that we help patients understand is that you can't really be on medication and not have therapy. Therapy and medication, it works hand in hand, right? And so any therapist that's just working with a patient have to have a good relationship with the psychiatrist that's prescribing the medication because the psychiatrist is going to want updates on how the person is doing in therapy, how the person's responding to different things that's being done in therapy. And so um, you have to, you have to, uh, you, you know, sometimes you may need to, the person who's depressed may need to be on medication. There's no, there's really, there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, the medications have side effects, but um, the idea would be to talk to your doctor about the side effects that you're having so that way they can help figure out, you know, how best to help you. But, um, you know, if a person is really that depressed, don't dismiss medication, right? You know, and then the other thing too is that, um, you know, there's other things that that you can do to um, help with depression, like just, you know, encouraging the person to go out, get some fresh air, going for walks, different things like that. But all you always want to make sure that they get mental health treatment. That's that's very important um, in order to be in order to be uh, successful in overcoming depression. And I mentioned earlier that when a person has clinical depression, um, those neurons in the brain they shrink. But with the right treatment, with the right treatment, um, and, and and really focusing on the depression, the, the, those neurons can actually grow back, um, and, and and you can get to that point where you saw the brain on the other side where all of the neurons were connected, right? So that's where you want to be, right? But if again, if we allow it to fester, it just gets worse and worse, right? And then eventually uh, your your brain will age age quicker. And then it, it opens the door for all the uh, um, a lot of other diseases that impact your brain, right? So here here are some um, here are some resources uh, specifically for the Hudson Valley. Um, so one of the things I do have to say about the Hudson Valley is that they have a lot of resources for people who are uh, suffering from mental illness. Um, you know, you got the suicide the national. This is a national line, but a suicide hotline. You have the Dutchess County Helpline, and you know we work closely with them because um, the hospital I work at is in Dutchess County, so um, we work with them, and they're, they're really good. Um, Ulster County, Orange County, um, we got the Teen Crisis Hotline, and um, you know sometimes you know teens now they sometimes they just prefer to text. They can always uh, text to this number here, 
um, and someone, a trained counselor will respond. Um, then we have the Society uh, for the Prevention of Teen Suicide. And I encourage every parent to go on this website and, and there's a lot of very good resources to really, that goes in depth into some of the stuff that we spoke about tonight. And so with that, um, I wanna close out and um, open it off for any questions. Thank you. I have a question. So it's amazing information, by the way, and thank you for sharing it. What do you do if you're a parent and you talk with a child and they say something like um, they're going to kill themselves or they say something like one of those warning signs that you mentioned? How do you as a parent handle it if they're little? Well, I think, you know, depending on the, uh, the, the child's level of development, right? When somebody says, I want to kill myself, um, you definitely want to, um, what you don't want to do, I'm going to tell you what you, know, what you don't do, is, is look, look startled and afraid, even though internally you may be feeling that way. You want to get the person to the point where, especially your child to the point where they're telling you why they feel this way. Um, you know, what's, what's causing them to feel like this? Because there's something somebody said to them, something somebody did to them, something happened to get them to the point where um, they started feeling this way. So that's really what you want to focus on and then um, getting that child some help. Right. So, mom, you know, your child's young, you'll say, look, mommy's going to take you to somebody to help because, you know, mommy, mommy wants you to start feeling better. And so, um, you know, you, you take, check the child to get, get the child seen by somebody um, so that they can help, you know, help with the situation. Thank but you. the first step would be to first step would be to figure out what's going on with that child. Um, so that way, um, so that way, you know, you, you have a sense if there's any type of um, any type of other situation going on with the child that's that's causing them to feel that way. Thank you. And what if it's um, them that, telling you about somebody else? Like they say somebody else said that to them. A friend of theirs or. Yeah, so I would I would um, I would get in touch with that person's parent and um, or, you know, I'll get in touch with that person's parent and, and say that, you know, my daughter told me that, you know, whoever the kid is. The name said this today that they were talking about killing themselves um, and, and let that parent just let that parent know. And then, you know, so that parent can take appropriate steps to protect their child. Thank you. So, but David, you mentioned that. OK. Oh, I think I was muted. Did you get a question? No, I can hear you. Okay. Well, what's the question? I mean, you, you mentioned, or it was in the PowerPoint presentation, that depression is brain damage, right? Uh, what causes the brain to damage, for one? What, what can cause the brain to damage? And does medication actually fix the damage? Because you did mention that uh, some people might need medication. Uh, and um, and is it something that because I know a lot of times uh, mental illness is usually runs through families, you know, from generations people have mental illness, and if the brain is damaged, you know, is it, you know, is it not, uh, you know, how could it be transmitted to genes if it's, you know, if it's damaged? So. So uh, yeah, you have two questions. So the first question is how does depression impact the, how does depression cause brain damage, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so your brain has neurons, right? Those are your nerve cells. And those are like the primary, um, those, those, the neurons are what sends the messages through your body to do certain things, you know? And so when you, when a person is depressed, these neurons, they shrink. They shrink and then you know they they their ability to do what they're supposed to do is compromised because it shrunk. And so once that happens, once that happens, um, and, and this is caused by depression, once that happens, you know, you know, physically, you're not able to function because the and just to set the record, your brain is the most important organ in your body. It's only three pounds, but it's the most important organ in your body because that's like the computer of your body. 
And so when your brain is not, when you're depressed and your brain is not functioning properly, um, you know, it, it will cause, you know, your, your neurons will shrink and then it'll cause other issues uh, throughout, throughout your body. Okay. And then your question about uh, genetic predisposition. So it, it does, it does like if, uh, if another relative or um, if another relative or, um, you know, if another relative is depressed or has, has depression, then there is a likelihood that it'll continue running in the family. You know, we call that genetic predisposition. Um, there's really, there's really no like, there's really no like um, clear explanation why, right? Um, it's like with a lot of other illnesses, right? Um, so like with diabetes, with cancer and different things like that, scientists have linked um, that if you've had cancer in your family, if you've had diabetes in your family, they, they can't, um, you know, they can't say specifically why it is, but they know that there is a link, right? So it's, it's kind of the same with depression. We know that there's a link because you'll see it, like, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's really, it is, it's true. We'll, 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 we'll have like a, we'll have like a son in the emergency room for depression. And that's sometimes we, we, we're treating the parent, the, the mother at the same time, right? The mother will be, come in maybe a month before, the son will come in a month after, right? It's, it's, it, there is an established link, but um, the, the, it's like, it, the, the, there's, there's no depressive gene, I should say, right? There's no, there's no identified depressive gene, but there, there is a, an established link between family members who have mental illness. Does medication fix it though? That's still a question. So medication, med medication does help, right? Every case is different, right? Every case is different. There's some people who are going to need to be in treatment for three or six months and you, you see improvement. Some people may need to be in treatment for a year. You see improvement. Some people may need to be in treatment for five years. You see improvement. Every case is different. But the point is, is that if the point that we want to establish is that if it's left alone, it can only get worse. And down here, usually, again, suicide follows. Right. So the idea is that um, and that's why they have different medications for depression, because. You know, each medication work, each medication, they, they work differently. Right. And, and some may have a different impact. So sometimes, you know, you know, per, a person may get upset. Oh, they're trying different medications on me. But it's really because they want to they want to find the right medication that works for you. Right. And there's really no way to figure that out unless it's tried, unfortunately, right? It, we, you know, you wish that, you know, if Troy comes into the emergency room, Troy says he's depressed, Prozac will work for Troy, right? We, we, we wish that we were able to do that, but unfortunately we can't, right? We just have to, you just have to try until the patient finds the right medication. And sometimes that's why, um, you know, if a person comes in as a depressed and not suicidal, um, we talk about them coming in voluntarily because when they're, they're at, when they're admitted to the hospital, when they're admitted to the hospital, um, that, that's when they really get to see how medications will work. And then when they're discharged, that's the point when they, you know, while they're working on them, then they can figure out which medication would be the right medication to stabilize the depression. But um, medication alone is not going to do it. It has to, it has to be medication and therapy. Not just not just medication, not just one of the others. Medication and therapy. Sometimes um, therapy may be enough, right? But most times it's it's medication and therapy. Okay. Can I, can I do have a question? I think there's there's a few people with their hand up. I just don't know who who was up first, um, but I see a few hands. I see like three hands. Um, so we'll go with Stephanie. We'll go with Stephanie. We'll go we'll go with Jacqueline, and then we'll go with Maxine. Yeah, um, good, good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to add one more thing that we can do um, as a church. Um, since COVID, the state has been training, I know for me, teachers in restorative justice practices. Um, Elder Trammell is on here, so he's aware of, of that. Um, and what it is, is really just calling a circle and having your youth, your young people, sitting in that circle. At first, it's going to be very difficult because they hate it. But as you continue to do it, they become accustomed to doing that and they will open up. I encourage us to do the circles at home with our families, husbands, wives, 
and the kids, if you have kids, do the circle there and be very, very open as best as you can and be very honest. Those are the things seem, it seem very silly to the students, to the, to the children at times, but it helps. It helps them to start talking because what these, these te teens need is an avenue to unleash some of the things that they're going through. Sometimes they can't find it at home and that's the reason why the state, currently I am training as a restorative justice practitioner with the state. So the state is currently training people. If you're interested, you can go on the state website and you can look up that and you can be a part of it. You can come back to your church and it doesn't have to be just the teens. The adults also need a restorative circle or restorative, um, restorative practices as we you know, navigate this crazy world. I just wanted to add that. And, that, and one more thing before I go. Um, I know that in our churches, mental illness is not seen as an illness. And I say that because of my own experience. I remember I was experiencing some anxiety and some issues a couple of years ago. And I remember I stood up in church and I gave a, tes a testimony. And I remember one of the brethren got up and he said, he quoted a text. He said, the Lord will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And I'm saying to myself, when I'm done, I'm like, are, is my mind not stayed on God? And that is the reason why I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm depressed or, or having anxiety. It's not the case. It's not true. The best of us as Christians, Solomon experienced anxiety and depression. David, at times, several of our great Bible scholars and warriors, they did, they experienced these, these um, um, things David just described. I just wanted to add that to um, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Maxam. I think that lady before me, you said I was, oh. coming, I was third. Oh, Ms. Hector, yes. Go ahead, Ms. Hector. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I came on a little late, so I don't know if you covered this, but I have this specific situation. Uh, my niece, who is a young adult, maybe, 32 or something like that, my son's age. And um, all the cousins, which is my children and, and all the cousins that age saying, something is wrong with, let us let me call her Anita. Something is wrong with her. She's not acting right, da, 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 da. So lately she said, God has been speaking to her and um, she just upped and drove to Texas. She said she's relocating to Texas because God has spoken to her. And um, God told her she's going to have two children. She doesn't even have a husband, a boyfriend. Or that. God, you know, she's just talking like that. So I got kind of concerned. I texted her and, and I said, what's going on? You know, talk to me or, you know, you know, me being her older aunt. And she responded and says, how dare you? I find that very, um, forgot the word. And thank you for sharing your, your authentic self Auntie Jackie and I was like what so now I'm like what to do now she's offended she said don't talk to her anymore and and I felt very badly maybe that's why the cousins weren't bringing it up to her so what do I do now so basically she's she's been like a bit impulsive like getting up and move I mean that you know that that is concerning um is she an adult? She is 30, but um, her mother died um, suddenly from a heart attack a few years ago, and she and her mother were at odds when she died. So I feel that over the years that has bothered her, and I think, because I we see symptoms of that, and she talks about things like that, about y'all don't know what happened, you, you, about me and my mother, and then, yeah, da, da, things like that. So I feel that that's bothering her over the years, and it's intensifying now. Okay, so what we could do, right? Um, Pastor Bolgen has my, my contact information. Um, we could talk offline because um, this is like a specific case scenario. So uh, we could talk offline and you know figure out how best how, how, how best for you to help her. Um, so uh, Pastor Bolgen has my contact information. So we could we could talk further. Okay. Yeah, because we, we we need to hear a little bit more you know about the history and all that stuff, and then that, and that way we'll be able to better figure out how best to help. Okay. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Maxam? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you might wind up telling me the same thing about offline because this particular particular person I knew for many years, the coworker, you know, 
and I haven't really heard from her in a while, but for her to reach out to me, and then I'm hearing what you, you know, this topic, you know, cause um, she had DM me and then she was, you know, you could hear, you know, she's crying and, you know, saying, um, I know she had lupus. So I'm trying to figure out is, if, if it was her, her sickness or, and then she would, she also mentioned about um, her best friend, a male friend that just died. So I'm trying to figure out if that's what's, why she hurting or whatever, right? But the way she's talking to me, it ain't right. That's not, that, that's not the person that I knew, right? I know this is a strong black woman. I didn't, I didn't never heard this kind of negativity. And what made this week when she um, DM me, I said, oh, so how you feeling today? She just said, well, I feel much better. I don't feel like jumping. See, this is the first time she ever mentioned anything like suicidal. The whole time she complaining and, you know, crying and all of that. This is, you know, and then I ain't know what to say, you know? And it was like, uh, you know, how can you make somebody, how can, what can I say or do to make somebody feel better? Especially, you know, you talking over, I don't know if she came to me because she know I'm a Christian or, or she's trying to reach out for help. I don't know. And I don't know what to say to her or what to do. And this is a, I think she's, she got be close to maybe 50, I think, if not, maybe younger, but you know, grown person. I don't know what to say. Yeah, we, we often find ourselves in that situation where we have people that come to us with, with uh, terminal illnesses and, you know, different things like uh, other stresses. We, you know, like if somebody just passed away, we, we struggle with finding the right things, to, right things to say. And the answer to that is don't say anything. Right. The answer to that is don't say anything, but listen. Um, when people are in a state of, um, you know, let's say a terminal illness, they just lost a close relative, uh, a close loved one. Um, that's not the time to really talk and give advice. That's the time to, to listen. Um, you, people will be surprised how powerful listening is. And so the reason why she probably came to you was because um, she needed somebody to just listen to her. Um, and so sometimes all you all you can do is just listen. I mean, obviously, if there's concerns about her, like if she says, I want to end it and stuff like that, you you know, you would you call 911 and get us some help. But if she's just like venting to you um, and, and just telling you how she feels on a day to day basis, just listen, just listen. Um, and and you, you'll be surprised um, how powerful that is for the person who's going through the struggle, um, how powerful that is to have somebody there that, that, that just listen, non judgmental and just just listen. Um, you, you'll be surprised, but yeah, if you, if you can't find the right thing to say, don't say anything, just listen. And you know, you're right about that. Cause, um, right after one conversation, she just thanked me for listening. You're right about that. Yeah. That, that's all they, that's all they need really. Sometimes it's, they don't realize that's what they need, but like you said, at the end, they'll realize that that's all they needed is somebody just to listen to them non -judge and, and be non-judgmental. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, doctor. Yes. Yeah, I Wait. have a family member who's like about 27 and he has depression. And he's seen a psychiatrist and a, and a therapist. And he's on medicine. But the thing about it is that he has a substance problem with marijuana. And I'm wondering if if he's if the marijuana if he need the marijuana because the the medicine for that he's getting is not enough or is some other reason why just bad habit why he use it. So the person basically the person's using marijuana and they're they're depressed. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when a person is on. Um, you know medication any type of medication they should not be using marijuana marijuana is not good anyway. Um, I just want to put that out there. It's really not good because it, it does um, impact their, their judgment. It impacts your insight. So marijuana is really not a good, not good for anyone to use. Um, it's not a good drug for anyone to use. 
Um, I know, I know it's being, it's heavily popularized. It's, 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 it's legal now in New York. Um, so, you know, but I just, I just want to make it clear here that um, marijuana is not a, not, not, not a good drug to use. It, it does um, long-term damage. Um, it does, it does cause like, you know, you, you won't be able to make, make decisions. You won't be able to rationalize a reason. It, it, it really, it really messes you up. Um, long term, so I just want to. And if the person is depressed, it'll make them, it'll make them more depressed. Um, you know, sometimes when they get when they get high, they may feel better, but when they come off of that high, they're gonna feel really bad. And it, yeah, it's really not a good drug to use. Um, Elder, Elder, um, Elder Chambers, great, great um, presentation. Uh, I, I wish we had more young people online to uh, view this or to listen to this. And definitely we're talking to our, to our um, youth department leaders to actually book you again to present this. But I, 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 I need to find out um, based on the time, how, many, how much more time do you have? How... Uh, um, we got a good, we'll go for another 15 minutes if you want. Another 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have Elder Hall. Elder Hall has his hand up. And um, I guess uh, we can have some other questions. If anyone wants to put something in the chat, a question in the chat, we can um, probably monitor it that way as well. All right. Pastor, so my question is very uh, simply, can I get the, or can you put in the chat the information for that state training that Sister Stephanie mentioned? Uh, if she can put that in the chat so others can get access to that. And, and then secondly, um, uh, I think a lot of, we mentioned it earlier, this, this two year uh, COVID uh, season has done a lot of damage, not just to young people, but to everybody. And what are some of the recommendations that we can do to, to help get out of that? I know that people are still sort of half in, half out. If you look around society, uh, schools are half open, some mass, some not mass. Restaurants, the sporting events seem to be wide open, but the churches seem to be still mostly relatively unattended so there's this mixed bag and and so it's confusing and how what are, you, what are some of the recommendations that we can try to, to to create that sense of normalcy on a wider scale not just on these specific areas so um generally speaking right um and everyone's different right everyone's different but they you know people need to people need to feel safe um, that's just the bottom line, like apart from mental health and stuff like that. Um, the reason why a lot of people are staying away is because they, they may still like they may still not feel safe. Right. Some people may have lost several family members to COVID. And so there's that trauma. Right. You know, um, so they stay away. It's, it, it, it varies. Right. It varies. But um, I think generally um, people still don't feel feel safe. We, we we've gotten mixed messages um, in the media. Like one point last year, they told they told us we didn't need to wear a mask anymore. Then a month later, um, then a month later, they they came back and um, said we have to start wearing masks again. And then we had this surge where people were dying. So it it really it really has. There's a lot of factors involved, but it, it mainly has to do with people's level of trust. Um, with the information that they're getting and th their, their their safety. Now you have some people that are that don't care. Um, you know, they, nothing's going to stop them from going to church. They'll wrap up in masks. They'll wrap up in uh, face shields. They'll come to church. But everybody's different. Um, and I think the ultimate thing is that people want to feel safe. They want a consistent message of safety. Um, and until we start to see that, um, you, you'll still have you know situations where. Churches are, um, there, there's a lot of uh, people that are not coming to church. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing is that sometimes people may not come to church, but they'll go to work, they'll go to the supermarket, you know, different things like that. But I think, you know, apart from that, um, it, it really has to do with people feeling safe and getting a consistent message on um, what COVID is. And, you know, it's only two years into it. Um, we, you know, it, it's really not a lot of time to, to really figure this disease out. I mean, scientists are doing the best they can with the information they get. 
whatever information they get, they, they come out with it and they share it. But um, to, to study a disease like this, you need, a, you need at least a good 10 years to, to really figure it out. Um, and we're just not at that point yet. So we're going to keep getting inconsistent messages. But the, the bottom line is, is that um, people want to feel safe. And until they, until they really feel safe, you'll, you'll still start to see this mixed attendance in church. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And if we can just get that information in the chat, that'll be helpful. Thank you. I have a question. What do you recommend that we do in a professional setting when you have someone who's an adult who is admitting that they feel depressed and they can't think and, you know, they're just stuck in their mind, but they don't want to go to seek counseling and they don't want you to call anyone on their behalf? Like, how would you recommend um, addressing a situation like that? You know, it depends, right? Um, if the person is like actively, if the person is just depressed, then that's different. But if they're like actively suicidal, saying that they want to kill them, then, you know, there's an obligation to call 911. The person's reporting to you that they, they're thinking about killing themselves, you, you should call 911. Um, the person might hate you for it, you know, but they allow you to remain uh, confidential. But, um, you know, at that point, when they're telling you they want to kill themselves, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a public safety issue. So, you, you know, you got a responsibility to call 911. If they're just depressed and, um, you know, you know, things like that, it's, it's, you know, you could keep talking to them and encourage them to get help. But once it, once it crossed the line to, um, once it crossed the line to where they are um, saying that they want to kill themselves, you got to call 911. Okay. Um, can a position uh, defiant disorder, can it cause depression? Well, there's a there's an established link between um, you know depression and other mental mental health conditions. So, like with bipolar disorder, there's a, there's a there's a component where they get uh, very depressed and suicidal, um, and also with a lot of other mental health diagnoses. So, if they have like ADHD, they have oppositional defiant disorder. Yes, it, it can. Like untreated, the key is is untreated. Like when you get to the point of clinical depression. That means you had a lot of other stuff going on that went untreated. And so um, it's at that point where, you know, you have to, uh, you know, you have to catch it early on. So if the person have um, opposition to find disorder, you get it treated so that it don't turn into something worse um, to where it gets to the point where it becomes uh, clinical depression. So, I mean, you support um, medication in a lot of mental health uh, situation. You do support medication. Yeah. Hmm. But but obviously you should have a you should have a conversation with your doctor. Um, you should have a conversation with your doctor, and um, you know, I'm not saying you per se, but the person yeah, should yeah, have a conversation yeah. with their doctor about what's best for them. But um, yes, it's it's definitely you know recommend that medication and therapy they go it goes hand in hand. But I mean, I've noticed um, throughout my life growing up in the islands, and so anybody who were mentally ill, I knew never ever got better and they're on medication i've never known anyone who was back to normal or normal so how 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 i mean how effective it's, is medication it's a it's a case by case it's a case by case basis sometimes better might mean that they don't get worse right sometimes better might mean that they're they're established at a baseline so while they may be they may have some impairments in functioning it's not to the point where it's unsafe for them to be on the streets and not, it's not to the point where it's unsafe for them to function in society, right? They may still be mentally ill, right? And that, that's what we gotta establish, right? And sometimes the person may, may go through the pressure for the rest of their life, but the idea is to um, have it controlled, right? So, you know, medications would, would help to control the brain activity, right? That depression causes. Then the therapy would help them to develop coping skills when they get these negative thoughts, what to do, right? That might be a condition they struggle with for the rest of their life. But the idea is to prevent it from getting worse, right? That, that's, the, that's the whole idea. Sometimes people may get out of it, right? And they may not need it anymore. It's, it's, it's all on a case-by-case -case basis and their, their level of resiliency. But um, there's, some, there's some people who will be chronic for the rest of their life and they have to be in treatment for the rest of their life. So, I mean, the reason why I ask, I'm not sure if you might be able to answer these questions because it's it's um 
it's something I have discussed with people, you know, you know, and have heard discussions about the relationship between uh, or the difference between mental illness and demon possession. Because if you look at some of the um, uh, stories in the Bible about people, you know, possessed with demon, today we would consider them mentally ill. Could it have been that they were um, mentally ill and it was termed demonic possession back then because they didn't have a term for it? Well, I, I think that that's part of the reason why I'm happy, you know, again, high thanks to Sister Charles for putting this together. As a church, we have to get out of that mindset that mental illness is um, a demon possession. Um, and one of the reasons why I showed you all the diagram with the brain is to show you that depression is actually a disease of the mind, right? Just like how we have disease of the body, cancer, uh, heart disease, diabetes, it's a disease of the body. Now, one clear example in the Bible, when we have somebody that was demon possessed is when um, they went, uh, Jesus and his disciples, they went into Jordan. They call it, they call that area the Gergen Seas. They had that man in the graveyard. He was, um, he was demon possessed and eventually they cast the, the spirit out and went into the pigs, right? Um, if you notice that man had, that man had like super, superhuman strength and Jesus went to him, prayed for him and he was fine, right? The difference between the difference between somebody that's mentally ill and, and demon possessed, um, it, it, you know, it's that's a, that's a spiritual issue. What we're talking about today here is is uh, is a disease of the mind, right? Demon possession is spiritual. Depression is a is a is a disease of the mind, and that that's what that's what we have to that's what we have to focus on. And and unfortunately, a lot of people in the church they have this notion that mentally ill mental illness. Is, is demon possession, which is not. It's a disease of the mind. And we, and we have to make that clear. It's a disease of the mind, right? We can pray for somebody that's mentally ill. We can definitely pray for them, but they need to get the right help. Otherwise, they're going to get worse. Just like how somebody has cancer. You're not just going to pray for them. You're going to pray for them, but you're going to get the medical treatment. If you, if you, if you pray for them and, and they, don't get, they don't get the medical treatment, um, they're going to get worse. So, you know, we got to understand that God put resources here to help us, right? And, and and that's what we that's what we have to focus on. All right, uh, Elder 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 uh, Elder Chambers, we have. Uh, can you give probably about ten more minutes or so? We have a few questions in the sure. chat. Uh, I will just read the first one. I don't think you answered this one, or you may have touched on it somewhat. He says, doctor, just uh, just to get some more insight on what to do about my family member that is depressed on medications and using marijuana. Do you think it is it? Uh, do you think it is a signal that the medication is not enough? And should it be told to the doctor that is treating her? Well, there's a there's a, there's a couple of things. So the the first thing they have to do is um, beyond treating the depression, they have to address the substance abuse issue. Like a lot of places, a lot of therapists, a lot of clinics, they won't see a patient that's actually using substances. They would have to go to a substance abuse clinic because um, you need to combine the treatments together. They need to address the, uh, the marijuana usage and they also need to address the depression. So there's specialized clinics for that and they're all over, they're all over the Hudson Valley. Um, so it's not an indication that the medication is not working. It's just an indication that that person may be addicted to marijuana, right? And so um, you have to get that person in a facility that can treat both the marijuana and the depression because um, it's two separate issues. Okay. And, okay. and the last, sorry, the last slide, the last slide that I put up, it had um, a few numbers on there. Um, you know, with, with, with how you could get people connected. So there was one for Dutchess County, one for Orange County, one for Ulster County. Um, so if you call those numbers, um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll cut and paste them and put them in the chat. Um, if you call those numbers, they'll point you in the right direction. Like if you have a, a relative that's abusing drugs and is depressed, they'll, 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 they'll send you to the right place to go. But it has to be a clinic that can treat the marijuana usage and the depression. Okay. Yeah, and I find that, Doctor, this is Brother McKinnon, I find that to be very common. Um, a lot of the young folks come in dealing with substance abuse and also have uh, mental disorders, and they end up 
uh, on our substance abuse unit. I work at Mid Hudson Regional as a chaplain. And so they come in and they treat them for their substance abuse and then send them to the mental health uh, unit to help them with their mental health disorder. And so you can't just say that they're using marijuana to help them. They may feel that way uh, the, and saying, but they may be addicted to the uh, marijuana, but also in need of the uh, medication that is gonna help them with their uh, chemical imbalance, uh, mental or chemical imbalance. So you need both. And one of the things we also hear that, uh, oh, I'm, they're just giving me the medication, but nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants, so I'm glad you put this as you stress, both medication and counseling. You can't have one without the other. They both go hand in hand. Yes. And we'll take uh, at least uh, two more questions, three more questions, three more the most, and then we will turn it over to Sister um, Sister Charles for closing remarks. And then um, from there, we will have um, Elder McKenna take it from there. I pray. Uh, I think we have one question here. Oh, Dutchess County. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. All right. If we don't have any more questions, um, Dr. Chambers, awesome presentation. Want to thank you. Uh, thank you very much for actually uh, sharing this time with us and for educating us as a church. I, I, I want to go out on a limb and, and speak to our youth leaders, uh, youth leaders um, to have um, Dr. Chambers uh, back at the AY, um, one of our AY's program. And uh, when pretty much we have most of our youth, when we have our youth available, um, so they can also um, get a hold of this invaluable, these invaluable information, this invaluable information. All right, so tentatively, um, Dr. Chambers, April 2nd, Youth Day, maybe, I don't know, but um, tentatively, all right, okay. Sister Thank you, Charles. thank you, Elder Chambers, so much for this presentation. Um, it's been a blessing. I'm sure that everyone has gotten valuable information and we will definitely work on on you know doing this again and having more conversations like these hopefully in person I know that um in person um it's you know we're more interactive even though the questions were great people were um speaking and and asking questions I think that um it's been a really um it was a really good presentation and information that we all appreciate and we learn from. Um, so, you know, I also want to thank everyone who came out yesterday, today, um, Dr. Blair. Um, I believe he's on here again, and I'm very grateful um, for everyone being here. I'm going to turn it over to Elder McKinney. He's going to close us out. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Chambers, for the great information that you've given us and enlightening us. You know, uh, one of the things we can always, and one of the things you always hear, oh, I'm gonna pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pray for you, but sometimes you need to have a little helping hand yes. more than just simple, excuse me, prayer. And so I'm glad that you're encouraging and waking us up to see that uh, we need to also take uh, skillful hands or skillful thought process to make sure that we are not just spiritually well, but we are physically and mentally well. Okay. And so we thank you and we're looking forward to having you here at Beacon Light Tabernacle. Let us close with prayer. 
Ah, eternal God and our Father. Yes, you do keep us in perfect peace when we keep our minds stayed on you. But God, you also tell us to be wise as serpent and harmless as a dove. You have given uh, doctors and counselors wisdom to know how to treat us physically, mentally, and also spiritually. We need a holistic approach to our good and well-being. We pray, God, that the information that we have received this evening will be helpful for those who uh, have family members and loved ones who are dealing with the issues of mental disorder, that they will not just take it lightly, but find the right pathway to bring hope, mm -hmm. to bring healing. And we just pray God under the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit, they will be directed. Bless us individually, bless us collectively. And as we continue to lift up Jesus, that all of us will be drawn closer to him, yes. letting him be the author and finisher of our faith. And we will be made whole again so that we will be entering into your kingdom when Jesus comes. Mm -hmm. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God's blessing.